let us begin the first on this series of COVID impressions, the webinar uh, to talk about our impressions of the COVID pandemic. Dr. Anita Shet. Dr. Anita is uh, the Director of Child Health at the International Vaccine Access Center, which is uh, more popularly known as IVAC at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in Baltimore, USA. There's really so much that we don't know yet. It's an evolving situation. There's much happening because of COVID and also the indirect effects of COVID, some of which I will be talking about. Um, but it's, it's really good to be here together and I'm uh, looking forward to a good interactive discussion. So thank you again. It's an honor to introduce Dr. Anita Sheet, who has been a constant source of motivation and guidance for not only me, but several other public health candidates at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Anita Sheet is a pediatric infectious disease specialist with broad interest in childhood infections in low and middle income group countries with a specific focus on vaccine preventable infections. Her interest includes clinical epidemiology and immunology of uh, dengue infections in, infa in infants and children. Uh, she leads a multi-center study on surveillance of invasive pneumococcal infections and clinical pneumonia in children and is evaluating the impact of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine in India. Dr. Shet is presently working as director IVAC, Johns Hopkins. Uh, she also serves on the Council of International Congress of Infectious Diseases and is member of Dengue Vaccines Advisory Committee on uh, Immunization Practice Workshop. She also serves on the NIH Candidate Vaccine Advisory Committee. Dr. Shet has authored several publications in international journals of high repute. Her work has been well recognized by public health community and she has been awarded with several awards and honors. I extend a warm welcome to my dear advisor and mentor, Dr. Anita Shet. We've heard a lot about COVID and um... The topic now that we'll talk about is about immunizations and vaccine preventable diseases. Um, we know that vaccines have made incredible inroads into population health and well being and have really saved over 100 million lives. It's hard to count. And they've been one of our most amazing public health tools. And the thing is, sometimes vaccines are victims of their own success, and we often lose sight of the power of vaccines. And I really hope, and I think we all hope, that the current pandemic situation does not make us again see the diseases that really should just be historical. So let's go to the next slide. Um, here's a picture of this really deadly virus. And we, as I said, we've heard so much about COVID. So this virus is transmitted through the air, spread through coughing and sneezing. And once a person is infected, the mortality is really high. We know that, right? And the commonest cause of death is pneumonia. So which virus am I talking about? So if you're all thinking of SARS-CoV-2, then that's not the one that I'm talking about. This is measles. We have a really safe and effective vaccine against measles. And uh, we don't want to see measles like we're seeing SARS-CoV-2 right now. Next slide. Now, over the, we've had good success with vaccines overall. Yeah. Um, and in the past few decades, they've really come down dramatically. But um, not all of the vaccine preventable diseases, the trend is not always downward, even in the pre-COVID era. And measles is really the classic example. So if you look at the slide here, do you see my arrow if I, probably not, right? Um, yeah, I don't think you can see my arrow, but um, the the uh, the uh, picture on the left shows the the trend of measles over the decades, and you can see that the cases of measles decreased dramatically between 1980 and 2010. But in 2018, the number of cases surged. And there were an estimated 10 million cases worldwide with over 140,000 measles deaths, really preventable deaths. And this is like a 50% increase since 2016. 
So that is quite dramatic. On the right side, there's a map and it shows countries where there have been ex really a huge outbreak of measles over the past three to four years. The Philippines, the Madagascar, Ukraine and the DRC. But following behind, sadly, is India, which is not shown in the map, but India also reported about 70 to 80,000 cases in 2018 and 19. So this is something to keep in the background as we go forward and look at the situation now. But next slide. Um, thank you. So before we go forward into the COVID era, I want to talk about some of the lessons that we can learn in the recent past. And this is the Ebola virus outbreak in West Africa in 2014. And this primarily took place in Guinea, in Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And together, they reported over 11,000 deaths due to Ebola. But the impact is really much more than Ebola if you look at the indirect effects. So there was a shifting of health resources to the Ebola response and breakdown of healthcare systems and stigma due to disease. And this is not unlike what we are seeing now in COVID. And there was also reduced vaccination and all these subsequent negative effects, particularly on maternal and child health, because mothers and children are often the most vulnerable people in society. And this table here actually shows some of the studies that um, report reduced antenatal visits and decreased child outpatient visits and decrease in vaccination. So these were actually reported events. And we, there was a group of scientists from Johns Hopkins who published a paper in Science that estimated that there could be over 1.5 million children in those three countries alone that would remain unvaccinated over a period of 18 months just during the Ebola outbreak and, and all the disruptions that were caused by that outbreak, resulting in over 20,000 deaths, in, as shown in the last row of this table. So this can be really dramatic if you translate that into the current period. Next slide. So recently, the World Health Organization and UNICEF did this worldwide poll or survey from different countries to look at what is the status of immunization services in the month of March and April. And here is a slide that was taken from a presentation that was made by Anne Lindstrand, who is the head of EPI at the WHO recently in another seminar that she gave. And this shows the countries, uh, so this is a world map which shows most of the countries that reported. The countries in red, orange, and yellow show some level of disruption, either total suspension or partial disruption of immunization services. So these are routine services given in clinics as well as outreach. So you can see how widespread the problem is just in the last two months. Um, next slide. So we also had the opportunity, our group um, at IVAC, to work with the WHO and look at these um, specific cases and um, see what the actual effects are. And we found that there could be over 80 million children who are under one year of age who could be at risk for vaccine preventable disease due to these disruptions in these different areas. And when you classify the level of disruption, whether it's complete, whether it's both fixed and routine immunization services and outreach, the number of children facing severe disruption would be about 71 million. So it's really huge and it's just been two months. Right? So again, there's a lot we don't know. So as we go forward, we will have to see what the actual effects would be of these levels of disruption. Um, next slide. So one of the earliest casualties of all the disruptions and the lockdowns that have been happening everywhere would are the campaign services. So they play a very important role in, um, in uh, trying to reduce the last year's pockets. And two big campaigns are the polio campaign and the measles and rubella campaigns. So the polio eradication campaign actually quite early on um, made this really painful decision of stopping their campaign services to reduce the risk to their workers and also to actually help 
countries, they shifted their workers to the COVID response because that was very important at that time. Although they tried to maintain at least the um, surveillance because that was important to know. And this map on the left side is taken from the Global Polio Eradication Initiative and the uh, URL is down there as well if you want to check. And they do a real time um, mapping of the cases of wild polio that's happening in different parts of the world. And what really struck me is if you look at the blue numbers, the blue numbers represent the cases of wild paralytic polio that have been reported. And the um, cases reported in from January 1st to May 27th of this year is 58. And the number of cases reported last year in the same period is 37. So this makes me nervous because it's just beginning and we are already seeing this increase of polio. So it's just such a um, ominous harbinger of what can come in the future uh, because of these disruptions. And the map on the right is another similar map that shows globally uh, about the measles rubella campaign. And the colors represent the density or the burden of measles in, in different parts of the world. And the countries that are colored in blue and yellow are the ones that are reporting disruptions of these campaigns. So again, um, it's just the first few months and we have to really keep um, antennae up about what's happening with these, with these conditions and the surveillance to know what's really going to be the impact going forward. Um, next slide. Mm, so, so that was a global picture. Now, in India, so India too is not very different. As you know, you talked about the lockdown and the effects and, and uh, all the direct and the indirect effects. So just focusing on immunization, we did a, an online survey that we sent around to pediatricians and primary healthcare providers in India through the Indian Academy of Pediatrics and the Maternal and Child Health Center in Kolkata. So they um, reached out to about 400 to 500 pediatricians who responded. And this is what we found. This is just preliminary data. And it, it looks like vaccination services have been suspended in most places. So most of the people who responded, so about over 80% said that these services were suspended, both in the private and in the public sector. And some clinics did remain open and there were partial services continuing, but they reported that the numbers of children seen had dropped substantially. So over half of them said that their numbers dropped to about 20 to 10% of what they had been seeing earlier. So that's quite dramatic. And it's not surprising because we know that India is in the lockdown period and there's obviously decreased uptake of service as well. And the reasons would be fear among the public and also the travel restrictions. Healthcare workers are also impacted. And there are changing health priorities because, of course, now COVID is now a top priority. Um, but it's just something for us to keep in mind that um, as we move on and we get more used to dealing with COVID, that we can't lose sight of these other really, really dangerous conditions as well. And many of these um, physicians and health workers came up with excellent suggestions as to what are the mitigation steps to be implemented in the near future. And some of the options that I've just put down here would be extended clinic hours, um, use of social distancing in more innovative ways. Uh, also door to door and outreach services should be expanded is what many people recommended. And a very important thing, a theme that kept coming up was about community awareness. And I know that Dr. Arun Sharma also mentioned that, as well as Bob uh, Balinja, that it's so important for the public to understand what's going on and what are the, what are the current levels of cases and um, the advances that we have in the medical and public health era, and also engagement of the public, that, that's so important. 
And then the other important theme that came up is to really bring people together to have more public-private partnerships and um, work together and increase collaborations to implement these services. Next slide. And um, is that the last one? I think it's one, yeah. So this is a slide I just put up because this is the internal guidance that the WHO put out very early in 26 March. And then subsequently they also published some FAQs and both the links are provided below. So they provide some general guiding principles about what can we do about immunization. And an important thing to reinforce that all governments have to propagate is that Immunization is a core health service that should absolutely be prioritized. Um, and at the same time, protecting the healthcare workers is critical. So, so much has changed in terms of our infection control practices in general clinics, use of PPEs. So all those things have to be brought into play. And then of course, there's um, a convenience factor and a cost factor. So those are very important for local policies to to revise and to review and also implement. And then the third bullet point is about vaccine preventable disease surveillance and how that should be maintained. Because in, in the most recent poll, we are also hearing that the surveillance mechanism is also being disrupted. And that can be dangerous if we completely fly blind that we don't know what's going on in terms of um, what the um, increase or decrease of diseases would be. And then countries should plan right away to design strategies for catch-up vaccinations, because that's critical. If you unimmunize a cohort of children or you, you don't immunize a cohort of children for about two to four months, then if you are able to catch up at least um, half of them, you've done a good degree of mitigation. So that's really important to put in place. And their, specific, their guidelines also focus on reinstating the routine immunizations and catching up, as we just mentioned, and also planning for mass campaigns again to restart. Um, so that's my last slide. And I just wanted to end to say that many countries are taking these guidelines and, and trying to adapt it to local um, context and try and implement it. But it's, it's a slow process because there are so many priorities now. And it's just important for everyone, for the healthcare people and policymakers and for the public to understand the importance of this because it's just something we can't afford to forget, even as we are dealing with COVID. So thank you. I, I'll just stop there and um, take questions later.